tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Welcome, Heartlanders, to Episode 8 of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Wifey producer says to me over a glass of tea on the patio yesterday, you need to come up with a new shtick for the opening segment. I looked at her and thought we had gone back in time, like J.C. Fields' super collider was somehow dropped into our backyard. I'm like, shtick? Really? Like, throw a shtick and see if Tess the dog brings it back? Like, shticks and stones? Like, this is some sticky situation we're in right now. Like, stop already. Her eyes are glazing over and she's all of a sudden not finding this amusing. I looked up on the old Google machine the word shtick. It's Yiddish originating in the 1960s, definitely before her time. I thought about pursuing it, but the super collider thing popped back in my mind. The thought of a multiverse and its ramifications led me right back here to the padded room. It is where I'm happiest, and I do tell people some of my best hours of the day are spent in a padded room. My story, and I'm sticking to it. Two tales tonight, I kid you not, Heath Paff and Eli Pope are going to mess with your head. <laughs> so much fun. Let's get after it. Jeffrey Thompson headed back home. His parents disappeared as if into thin air. The police, neighbors, friends have no idea as to their whereabouts. The only clues remotely possible to find reside in the family home and perhaps the deranged little old lady who lives next door. And now, for your indulgence, welcome home. They were gone. The call left me stunned, sick to my stomach. How did people go missing in today's world? How did two perfectly capable adults vanish off the face of the earth in a place where everyone knew everything about the folks who lived around them? You couldn't drink a beer in your backyard without the lady at the grocery asking if you wanted to pick up another six pack. So how did my parents go missing? The town hadn't really changed in the 20 years I'd been away. It was still just one street lined with old brick buildings full of businesses and a small sprawl of houses peppered around them, all of it surrounded in corn and soy fields as far as the eye could see. My destination was my parents' house, a two-story home that was over 200 years old, and yet as I pulled up to it with its new siding, updated windows and fascia, it looked just as nice as it ever had. The color was almost exactly the same. Mom had always liked green, and Dad had liked to see her smile, so green it was, with accents in a slightly darker shade of the same. Even the picket fence, painted in red, white, and blue by Dad and I when I was a kid, 
still looked bright and new. I'd expected to pull up and see the house wreck, my parents' car missing, police tape covering doors and windows. But instead, the scene was idyllic. My parents had bought a newer car, but it was fine, sitting in the driveway as though nothing was amiss. The large oak tree in the yard still had a swing hanging from a branch, and the little garden in the side yard was planted and growing. The birds were singing in the trees, and the air smelled faintly of apples and cinnamon. I looked next door to Mrs. Elsie's place and smiled despite the situation. Her apple pies were the physical manifestation of late summer in my childhood. She had always had a pie cooling near a window. It was like bait to bring in the neighborhood kids so she could regale us with the old stories passed down through her family. Probably if our parents knew about the freaky content of her stories, they would have been a bit concerned about us spending so much time there. But Mrs. E was harmless, and her stories were good, spooky fun. I took a deep breath and headed for the front door. I still had my key, but I tried the handle before checking it. As expected, it turned and I pushed the door open with ease. We had never locked up when I was a kid, and apparently that hadn't changed. A nagging part of me wondered if that's why my parents were gone now. Had someone broken in and kidnapped them, come upon them in the night and dragged them from their beds? But why? Why would anyone want to do that? My parents were retired, but they weren't wealthy. They lived within their means, and they'd inherited the house, so mostly it was just upkeep and taxes. Their car was newer, but it was a six-year-old station wagon and not even from one of those expensive German brands. They didn't have anything that someone would want to steal. I was the only surviving child, and I wasn't rich either, so it couldn't be about money. It was hard to suspect foul play because my parents didn't have enemies. But if it wasn't something nefarious, then where did they go? I'd been told the police had talked to everyone in the vicinity, and no one knew anything. The last time they were seen was at Christie's Diner in town, having fish fry together on Friday night like they usually did. No one had noticed any strange behavior. They talked about redecorating the house and doing some interior painting. They made plans to have a barbecue with friends the following week. And then they paid their bill and left, chatting on the way out the door. They got in their car and returned home. And that was it. Mother missed a hair appointment the following morning. Dad failed to show up to go fishing with his best friend David the day after that, and then people started getting concerned. Several calls were made and friends came to check on them, but no one answered the door. Finally, the police came down and did a search of the house and determined that nothing appeared amiss. None of their things were missing. All of their clothes and luggage were still there. Their car was fine. There were no indications of a struggle. The strangest thing noted by the police was that they had poured paint into those roller pans like they were going to paint the walls of one of the upstairs rooms, and then they never begun the process. The rollers were dried into the filled paint pans. I had to see for myself. I started on the bottom floor and walked from room to room. Everything was as it had always been. Even the terrible wallpaper was still hanging around and reminding me that some parts of the place still needed updating. After finishing my rounds downstairs, I headed upstairs to where the bedrooms were. The first room on the right was my old room. I opened the door to see that it was like a time capsule. The race car wallpaper was even still covered in stupid drawings I had done as a little kid. My parents hadn't changed it since I had left years and years before. I had told them it was fine to reclaim it and use it for whatever they wanted but they had insisted it was my space and I could come and go as I wanted. I knew this was them just making sure I understood that I was always welcome home, but I felt guilty that I still took up space in their lives. I felt a streak of cold race down my face and reached up to wipe away a tear. I took a deep breath and let it out slowly. The reality of this situation was finally starting to sink in. They were gone. They weren't in this house anymore. I could feel that emptiness. This wasn't a place where people live. Not now. It had been a week after the police had first made the rounds here that they had finally called me. 
Now my parents had been gone for over a week, and some part of me knew that this was a bad sign. Most missing people were found in the first 72 hours. I closed my little fragment of personal history and walked down to the next door, running my hand over the wood reverently and wondering if I should open it at all. This was my sister's room, Kelly. She had been abducted when I was one. My parents didn't like to talk about the incident. Her room had always been shut and I had only ever been in there once or twice. It was just a little girl's room. There was a toy box, a bed, pink curtains and pony pictures. She had pink wallpaper with strawberries on it on most of the walls, except for the one behind her bed, where they had taken it down to paint a mural of some children's show she loved. It hadn't been finished. The painter, Adam Franklin, had taken her and run. She had been ten when she went missing, and I couldn't remember anything about her. My parents tried to keep her alive for me by telling me stories about her, but she was just a shadow for me, a ghost that I'd heard about but never seen. Again, this room was frozen in time. It had never stricken me before how painfully heartbreaking this was. All these years gone, and my parents had never been able to put the pain away, not entirely. I couldn't begin to imagine how hard losing her must have been to them. I wondered what it would have been like to grow up with an older sister to watch over me. I pulled the door closed, feeling the emotional pressure of this place like a weight on my shoulders that wanted to fold me to my knees. This once happy place felt like a prison of memories. I pulled the door shut. The doorbell rang and I was pulled away from the turmoil of the past. I hadn't been ready for that shrill interruption of my melancholy exploration and it startled me a little, but it might have been for the best. I took a few steadying breaths and cursed quietly deciding I would ignore whoever it was, but then the doorbell rang again, this time twice in a row. Damn. I swore lightly under my breath and started back downstairs. Maybe a moment of company would help. This was harder than I had expected. I got downstairs to the door just in time for another quick ring, and then I was opening up. I'm here, I said, not wanting the bell to go off again lest its siren split my nerves in tway. I recognized Mrs. Elsie immediately, even if the years had left her looking the worse for wear. She had a cane now and walked with a slight hunch. Jeffrey? She said, her expression brightening some, though her eyes looked tired and sad. Had they always looked that way, or was this something new? Children are good at not seeing pain in others. Empathy is a hard skill to obtain. Mrs. E, I said warmly, popping the screen door and gesturing inside. She shook her head immediately. Oh no, Jeffrey, I mustn't. She looked almost afraid. And you shouldn't either. Won't you come over next door and have a piece of pie? I have one just cooled now. I opened my mouth about to tell her that I had things I needed to do but she had come all the way over here to see me, and it was obvious moving was hard for her, so instead I nodded. Sure, I said as I stepped out of the house and pulled the door shut behind me. I have really missed your pies. Mrs. Elsie smiled and started down the walkway and back towards her own place, a noticeable limp slowing her pace. I wondered if I should offer an arm, but she seemed to be doing well on her own and I didn't want to embarrass her, so I simply kept pace at her side until we were inside her place and sitting around the same kitchen table I had sat at hundreds of times as a child. She laid out a pie and some glasses of milk and then left a brick of sharp cheese with a slicer as she took a place opposite me at the table. It's so good to see you back, Jeffrey. I'm sorry that it's for such dark reasons. She said as I began to work on my pie, it was every bit as good as I remembered. Cinnamon and sweet, with the tart apple backing that was complemented perfectly by the flaky crust and the tang of the sharp cheese. I nodded, not entirely sure how to respond. I came back hoping to see something that maybe the police missed, to see if I could figure out where they might have gone, but 
So far, it's just an empty house. Oh, sweet Jeffy. You were always a good boy, but you can't help them. No one can help them. Her eyes were glassy, like she might cry at any moment. I had stopped with a fork halfway to my mouth. I sat it down. I'm not sure what you mean. The sudden creeping unease had instantly spoiled my appetite. I told you, kids. I told all of you. It's the Takers. They used to live in the woods here, but then our people came along and built houses where they once dwelt and hunted. We broke their ground and cut down their sacred trees and turned them into wood for our houses. So now they live inside with us. And when they get hungry, they... Every hair in my body was standing up and I had to stop her before she went any further. Mrs. Elsie, those are old stories. Just stories. You told them to us to scare us when we are little. None of it is true. You're just confused. She was shaking her head firmly. No, Jeffy. They were never just stories. They were warnings. What did I tell you about them? What were you supposed to do to make sure they couldn't get you? I sighed and humored her. Don't go in the cellar. Don't talk out loud when you're alone. Don't dig in the dirt near the house. Don't pull down the wallpaper. Don't lie to your parents. I repeated the lessons that we had always been given. Oh, and don't trade with strangers or talk to people who come out of the woods. This was like a laundry list of don't get in trouble things that I had always assumed were just to give us something to have learned from Mrs. E's stories. I told them too, Jeffrey. I'm sorry, but I tried to tell them, don't tear the wallpaper, don't take it down, but they wanted to paint. I tried to convince them to paint over it, but she shrugged helplessly, and I wondered if poor Mrs. Elsley had lost her mind or was starting to. I sat silently and ate my pie, really just wanting to leave, but now feeling awkwardly like I had to stay. It's not your fault, Mrs. E. Whatever happened, it's not your responsibility, I finally said, trying to find some way to comfort the woman. It is. I sold that home to them. I knew it was rotten, but I sold it anyway. She shook her head tears starting to slide from her eyes. I had the chance to just burn it to the ground, but I was greedy. I needed the money, and at first it seemed good. Your parents were happy, and they had Kelly. And the years went by, and I forgot that things were rotten here. I forgot. And then that poor girl and Adam. I knew what had happened, but anyone I told just looked at me like I was crazy. They wouldn't believe the truth. She'd invented a whole intertwined story to explain the bad things that had happened here over the years. Maybe she had been out of her mind longer than I thought. Was she harmless, or had she had something to do with my parents' disappearance? Or my sister's? Suddenly I was feeling a strong impulse to get out of that house. I stood up and started carefully moving towards the door. I have to go, Mrs. E. I have more work to do at the house. It was good to see you again. I wasn't sure that it was actually good to see her again, but it had been something. I'd already decided I was going to call the police and tell them about this incident. Even if she was just losing her mind, she needed someone to look in on her. Jeffrey, please don't go back to that house, she said and tears were starting to fall freely from her eyes now. Don't let them take you all. They will if you give them the chance. I'll be fine, Mrs. Elsie. I'm not planning on being here long. Now, if you'll excuse me. I slipped out the door as fast as I could, crossing back over to my parents' house and pulling the door shut behind me. I quickly locked it, and then went to the back and did the same there. I even walked around downstairs and made sure the windows were locked. I wasn't satisfied until I knew the house was secure. 
Then I sat down and dialed the local police office. I explained the conversation I had just had, and then I was put on hold, and eventually I was put on with the officer who had handled the in-town investigation. We already checked her out, he said. We should have warned you, I guess, but we didn't think she'd try her crazy story out on you as well. The monsters in the walls. It was an interesting interview. Anyway, we did a thorough investigation of her house and couldn't find any sign of foul play there. She doesn't get around that well, so we doubt she had anything to do with your parents. If she gives you any more trouble, you can call us here and we'll come talk to her. But she's an old lady with no family to take care of her, so there isn't too much we can do, I'm afraid. If it becomes bad enough, we can have her committed, but that's not something we want to have to do. I nodded to myself. I didn't really want that either. I just wanted to make sure someone knew about her story. It freaked me out a little. I laughed nervously. Bad things happen sometimes, but it's never caused by monsters. At least not the kind that appear in fairy tales. Humans have enough of their own monsters. Try to get some rest and let us know if you find anything that might help our investigation. We're still running with the leads we have. The investigation is far from over. We'll find out what happened to your parents. He assured me, and then... We ended the call. His words were, in some ways, a relief to hear. I'd let the neighbor lady really get to me, and hearing a more reasoned mind went a long way towards returning me to a place of calm. We'll find out what happened to your parents. That didn't fill me with any hope. He wasn't telling me that they'd find my parents, just that they would find out what happened to them. I leaned back on the couch where I was sitting, it was getting late and I had to figure out what I was going to do for the night. I hadn't planned much beyond getting here, but I'd have to stay now. There were things to take care of, things that I didn't even know how to begin handling. If my parents had passed away, there were steps I could follow, people I could contact. But with them missing, I didn't know where to begin. Glass shattered behind me, a shocking explosion of momentary chaos that had me on my feet in a moment. I turned and was looking into the open arch that led into the kitchen. The last of the evening sun was coming through the window in the opposite direction and it cast long shadows back into the dark part of the house. I couldn't see anything moving beyond the jagged edge of the light. Hello? I called out, though I wasn't sure exactly what answer I was expecting. All I could think of was Mrs. Elsie's last words to me before I left. Don't let them take you all. They will if you give them the chance. No, I said angrily to myself. I shook my head. I was letting myself get worked up over nothing. I had plenty to be upset about, but I didn't need to add monsters to that list. I forced myself to go into the kitchen, flipping the light as I entered the room. The warm splash of light that filled the room chased away the darkness, sending it scattering into the recesses behind appliances and in the corners. There was glass on the floor that I immediately recognized as belonging to one of my parents' favorite set of plates. It must have been sitting unevenly on the counter and just fallen off. Perhaps it was a mouse. We sometimes had them while I was growing up. Whatever had caused it, the room was empty, and now brightly lit, it didn't hold any more malice than the kitchen ever had. I leaned down next to the table and began to pick up the glass, grabbing a small dustbin and hand broom from under the sink. I was just finishing up the last of the glass when I looked up and noticed that the paisley printed paper on the wall I was facing had been torn away to expose bare wood paneling beneath its surface. It was strange to see, given that most interior walls were drywall hung on beams, or in the case of older homes like this one, just plaster walls. I finished up the glass and went over to look more closely at the hole. It had been roughly torn free, the jagged edge of the paper still hanging partially next to the removed portion. There were actually four layers of paper. The wood beneath was strange. I had seen lumber often enough to know what to expect, but this looked like it had been cut recently. In my parents' home, it should have been as dry as it was going to get. It had been sitting here for 200 years. I crouched down and reached out a hand to touch the wood. 
I drew my fingers back quickly. Cold. Damp. Did that mean this was a new addition to the house? Even then, why would it be cold? Summer was fading, but it was still warm out. I stood up uneasily, rubbing my fingers together as I turned back towards the sink, suddenly eager to wash my fingers clean of the feel of that unnatural paneling. My eyes passed over her entirely at first, but then I recoiled in terror as they settled again on a figure standing at the opposite end of the kitchen. I recognized the profile immediately, but that did little to calm the fright of finding someone standing where there had been no one a moment before. Mom? I asked, my eyes glued to the back of the woman standing near the kitchen counter at the opposite end of the room. Her back was to me, but she was wearing an old favorite sweater of hers, and her long black hair with its wisps of gray was unmistakable even from the back. Holy shit, Mom. Everyone is trying to find you? Where have you been? Now that the initial terror of finding her was over, I felt a trickle of relief. Mom didn't turn to me, though. Her hands were working on something in front of her. She didn't speak, didn't even move other than her hidden hands. Hey, is everything all right? I asked, taking a step in her direction. Where's Dad? Where have you both been? The cops are looking for you. Everyone is. Her hands stopped moving and I froze in place. The relief of just a few moments before was slipping away from me. She placed her spread hands on the counter in front of her as though leaning into it. Her head lifted up so she was looking straight at the wall in front of her and then it tipped to the left and her long hair draped to the side. I screamed. I had been scared before but never as terrified as I was in that moment when her hair moved aside and a set of empty eye sockets peered out at me from what I thought was the back of her skull. It wasn't though. As the hair fell away, I could see that her head was twisted around backwards, the skin of her neck bunched and twisted in an impossible grotesque fashion. I turned and ran as hard as I could. I was going so fast that it was more like a haphazardly controlled fall more than anything else. I didn't know where I was headed, really, just that it was somewhere outside of the house, or would have been had I not turned into the living room and seen my father standing in front of the door out. He was flayed open below the sternum, spread wide as though opened for drying on a rack. I could see his spine and the tops of his hip bones protruding through the meat of his flesh. His eyes were rolled back in his head, and his mouth was open wide in a scream that I wished was silent. However, as he seemed to sense me, there the scream became a real thing, a terrible keening of suffering unlike anything I had heard before. I was halfway up the stairs in seconds, falling over myself to get as far away from what I had just seen as I possibly could. I gashed my knee on the last step before I cleared it in a bound that skipped three others, and then I tore off down the hall, passing the shut doors on the sides of me and heading for the open one at the end of the hall. I passed inside and slammed it shut behind me. My hands were shaking so hard I thought they might rattle my fingers free, and my heart was beating even faster. I had reached a point of terror which precluded any rational thought. If I had been thinking rationally, I might not have run into the open room at the end of the hall, the room in the house that my parents had been repainting. I was looking out into a deep darkness that felt like it was moving closer to me by the second. In panic, I reached out and flipped the light switch by the door. The lights came on and I wished they hadn't. They stood in front of a wall stripped of its paper, an open stretch of wood paneling like the one in the kitchen. There were three of them, things of wood and bone. I knew they were alive because they moved as living things do, but there were no other indications from their shape. I had not seen living creatures assembled with such malicious indifference to function before. I couldn't find anything to latch onto in them. They had no faces, no torsos, and calling their many moving fragments limbs didn't make sense to me. They shouldn't have been able to move at all, but they did, closing the distance to me faster than I could have anticipated. An impossible grip settled on my arm, and though I tried to shake it free, it seemed to care not at all. Before long, the others had me as well, and then they began to pull me apart. The last sound I heard was my own screaming mixed with the popping of bone and sinew as I fell to pieces 
and they began to sup. Detective Jonathan Warren's Private Case Supplement The whereabouts of the Thompson family is still unknown, but given the findings at the house, I personally believe that this was perpetrated by the same man who abducted their daughter many years prior. The case notes go more clearly over the individual pieces of evidence, but I can't get the message in the kitchen out of my head. Welcome home. The forensic results clearly indicate that the bones used to make the message were from the remains of Kelly Thompson. We never found Adam Franklin and his whereabouts are still unknown. I don't think we'll ever know why he would do this. As an aside, I believe that the Thompson's neighbor, Mrs. Elsie, should be taken into care. She has no family and she has been making repeated false reports to both the local police and the state police. The night of our investigation into Jeffrey Thompson's disappearance, she tried to douse the Thompson house in gas and set it on fire. We have an officer watching her place now, but I fear she is a danger to herself and others. I hope you enjoyed Welcome Home, as written by Heath Paff and performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. To find more from Heath Paff, please visit simplyscarypodcast.com backslash paff, spelled P-F-A-F-F, -F, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com where you'll find ways to follow him on his website of foxesmind.com. That's O-F-F-O-X-S-M-I-N-D.com, as well as a link to his work on Amazon.com by clicking his Amazon link on that profile. A small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we are proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. Tonight's story, The Old Dead Tree by Eli Pope, is one of love gone bad and the ways one can pay a price for doing evil, even when the other draws first blood. Nature can have a way of succumbing to the ghosts and either helping or hindering an outcome for the survivor. A bitterly hurt man who literally loses about everything he touches has a mental battle to the end when life deals him its worst. And now, The Old Dead Tree. Chapter One Vernon Hasker sat on the porch swing, which had hung on the front porch of his old and now decaying farmhouse for many years. He had spent many an evening looking at that tree that had started as a small volunteer sapling all those years back. It now was in the process of being reduced to a large disappearing stump surrounded by sawdust floating in the air. He watched as Carl from Kettner's Tree Service run the large stump grinder over the oddly shaped wood remnant that was vanishing from sight in a tornado of shooting debris. Finally, that damn fucking eyesore of a memory will be gone for good, he silently thought to himself. Nary a single teardrop escaped from either eye, even though the tree had contributed a lifetime of memories. He wanted to picture the pleasant ones, the recollections from the beginning. Like back to the first time he had tripped over the young sapling and almost fell to the ground carrying his newlywed wife through the ark. Up the four steps of the front porch, and then across the threshold of their newly purchased home. Hell, they were both naked as jaybirds before they ever made it through the French doors of the bedroom. Clothes strewn from the open front door scattered all the way through the living room. A shoe here, a shirt there, bra and panties on the couch and floor. That goddamn tree had seen it all, and a whole lot more through the years. The old pig nut hickory had seen plenty of love, and of course the opposite of such feelings. Arguments, anger, tears brought on by making up. 
Yes, one would think some of these memories would spur at least the budding of a tear in even the most unhuman of a soul. But not today. Not in Vernon's eye. Old hickory seemed to grow quicker in the beginning, through the good times. There were years when either the weather or maybe the couple's lacking relationship or a slowing seemed to take hold of its growth spurt. But some years, when their relationship was spent copulating like busy rabbits, that goddamn tree seemed to grow several feet higher and thicker through the middle of the night. Of course, Vernon nor May ever seemed to take notice or see the correlation until later, after the event. It was a tragedy of sorts, mistakes made by both. The perfect storm that seemed to brew slowly but explode with a resounding end. A finale that could not be undone or ever taken back. Vernon's demeanor, nor the expression on his face, ever changed as he sat swinging back and forth, watching the last bits of the old guardian tree be reduced to dust and mulch. Carl Kettner loaded up his stump grinder onto the trailer and then slowly swaggered his way over towards Vernon, who still sat watching as he pulled the glass to his mouth and swallowed. Carl held a small notebook in his hand. Vernon thought it was probably the inflated bill of doing his business on a Saturday. How much this gonna cost me, Carl? Vernon asked as he continued slowly swaying back and forth on the swing, not missing so much as a single forward and back motion. His worn out shoes planted firm on the chipped painted boards as he loosely grasped his tall glass. Well now, Vernon, being how it's my normal day off and all, yeah, yeah, here comes the screwing. I bet I don't even get another drink for you get me bent over the railing and begin... Damn it, Vernon, that's just wrong in every sort of the word. I ain't never done you bad before. You know that to be true. Why in hell did you think you needed this work done before a weekday anyway? Damn tree was pert near dead and dang sure wasn't going nowhere on such a nice weekend. I reckon that be my business, Carl, and none of yourn. Just give me the damn bill and I'll get you paid. I'd offer you a lemonade, but you'd just squeeze all the good from the lemons and leave me nothing but the seeds and rind. Vernon stared intently as he reached from his seated position for the piece of paper. Why are you such a bitter old coot, Vernon? It's hotter than devil on fire and all you've been doing is watch me sweat my ass off working. Only muscle you moved while I cut up that trunk into pieces was lifting your damned whiskey sour to your lips with a danged old scowl across your face. Vernon slowly got up as he grabbed the swing's chain with his right hand. I'd done it myself back in the day, Carl. Wait till you turn 65. Ain't no young man can endure the pain I have. His legs wobbled a bit until he got his balance. Carl reached out to steady him, but Vernon swatted his hand away. Hey, get your check. You keep your damned hands to yourself. The screen door slapped closed with a whack, and Vernon disappeared into the darkness of another room. Carl leaned against the railing until he fell to give some. He stood up quick and reached down, grabbing it with his hand and shook it. It moved quite a bit, and he shook his head in disdain. He hollered through the screen door. I can sturdy these railings out here before you or someone visiting leans too hard again it and get give away, spilling an ass to front yard and bringing you a lawsuit. A minute or two later, Vernon opened the screen door with a barely legible check in his hand. Don't you go worrying about my business less than I ask you about it. Nobody got business being here anyway. I don't send out no goddamn invitations to throw parties. Carl took the check and folded it, placing it neatly into his sweat-drenched t-shirt pocket. He wasn't sure he'd even try and cash it. Probably wouldn't clear anyway. He grabbed his waistband with both hands and hiked his jeans up higher before tipping his straw hat to leave. I appreciate you, Vernon. Your company ain't always real pleasant. But I do feel for you all these years after May disappeared on you. Everyone in town has feelings of pity, too. I don't ask for nobody's pity nor thoughts. I asked to get a bothersome tree and stump removed, and you done it. I reckon after I stack it, it'll be all right. 
Now get on out of here and enjoy the rest of your day off. Carl held out his hand to shake Vernon's, but all it drew was another cold response. What? I didn't pay you enough? I was trying to shake your damned hand, Vernon. Closing our business dealings as good people and friends do. Well, I guess you better save that for your next friend or victim. Good day. Chapter 2 Vernon sat back down in the metal chain holding the swing, restarted the same squeaky tune again. With the same blank stare, he watched Carl Kettner's truck and trailer, which held the stump grinder, pull out and make the left turn towards town. He tilted his head back and breathed out a slow, wispy breath as if a truckload of tension leaked from his body. He closed his eyes. His glass of whiskey sour sat on the small wooden table beside him, the ice melting quickly into tepid water and sinking lower than the alcohol in the glass. Another sigh passed across Vernon's lips. You can't haunt me no more now, May. Your cheating memory is buried in the ground along with your rotted corpse. And to think I once loved you with all my heart. His words came out barely more than a whisper. Vernon had slowly whittled the old pig nut hickory tree limb by limb because the memory of that violent event so long ago kept coming back. Ain't nothing left to amputate no more, May. Old Hickory is dead and gone forever, just like you and your hawing ways. You can't come back now and show your temptress body and lust-filled eyes to taunt and intimidate me. That tree is as chopped up as your fornicating body is. The pieces of you and its sawdust lay in the ground to mix and melt into the dust and bone you surely decayed into. Vernon's eyes remained closed and the tune of the squeaks from the porch swing's chains continued. The only other sounds were the ice cubes melting and toppling into the now watered-down drink. Vernon's words of contempt for his deceased wife dribbled away quietly to a hush as a broken snore began to take the place of the venomous words that seconds ago dribbled from his mouth. Sawed-off chunks of the old dead tree lay in sporadic piles across his front lawn, scattered about from the violent carnage that just took place. It seemed a fitting metaphor today to the afternoon of carnage so long ago. An afternoon every bit as hot then as this one was today. At some point, Vernon must have awoken and gotten up from the swing, putting himself to bed, even though he retained no memory of doing so. He did, however, wrestle back and forth from one side to the other, unable to attain a position of comfort that would last long enough to get the deep sleep his body truly needed. His mind kept him busy in a stupor that resembled slumber. The memories hadn't left completely just because the hickory tree was non-existent anymore, having been vanquished by death from his property. Vernon's eyes began to twitch, first one and then the other in random waves. His breaths became heavy and full at times, then quieter and more labored at others. He was dreaming. But in his world... This was no dream at all, instead a recollection of the sins from his past. May had come back despite the actions brought on this afternoon with the help and efforts of Carl and his equipment, efforts he had bought and paid for. Work was slow at the cabinet shop today. The heat was horrible. It had been for days. Humidity was heavy in the air, so swampy one felt like they were sucking salt water with every breath drawn. People became agitated and quick to ignite their fuse of bitterness because the temperature was not letting up. Even at home during an evening, the temperature still hung over them in the torrid lower 90s. Breaking points of anger grew from the frustration of the pattern that refused letting up. The Red River, just off Highway 91, was west of the Union Baptist Church and shrinking in its banks because of the lack of rain. This spot of land, which overlooked one of the narrowest parts of the winding waterway, is where Vernon and May settled their little homestead. The ten-acre plot of land with an old white clappered two-story farmhouse which sat in the middle of the acreage. Land Vernon purchased, so he would be a property-holding gentleman. A far better catch for a young girl back in those days 
than a wandering soul working as a temporary farmhand would be. Hell, Billy Hill, the man in question, could never afford to purchase an offer property to May. Not that he would have wanted to plant roots for long anyhow. He may have been a dark, handsome man with a chiseled chin and physique of a Greek god, although Vernon never saw it. He did, however, realize Billy would never amount to nothing as far as providing a vivacious woman like May anything of consequence. Nothing anything more than a tryst in the bedroom. May was a gorgeous treasure. She was far more valuable than just a naked, fling-filled romp. A treasure Vernon was not ready to relinquish his aspirations of marrying her. Sure enough, though, he had seen May talking to Billy, and to him she appeared too close to succumbing to those sexual desires of that fucking gypsy who was only out to satisfy his own desires. On occasions, he did witness these flirtatious meetings of theirs, and it angered him deep down to his core. A hate he never knew he held inside. It heated him up far hotter than the temperature of the current sweltering heat wave. He wasn't going to allow Billy to paint the girl he soon held hopes of obtaining for a lifetime. Sweat and frustration grew within. He had put everything he owned on the line and then a hefty loan note from the bank. He wasn't going to lose May and his life savings to any wandering bastard. He'd by God be marrying May. They were made for each other. Some stranger move-in type come into town and spoil his treasure? No fucking way. He'd kill him if need be. But it seemed May was in love with Vernon after all, just as much as he was in love with her. Billy moved on to some other town and Vernon and May married. Life was good. The money was good. The hours were long, but the cabinet shop kept the property payments to the bank on time, food on their table, and a little extra each payday for the savings account. Vernon was on track with his life's plan. May ended up working at the Union Baptist Church, which wasn't a far walking distance from their new home. Her job wasn't out of necessity. It was from boredom. She wasn't meant to be just a housewife. Not until they had kids. Vernon hadn't ever been a Baptist before. Hell, he ain't ever been any religion at all. But May convinced him to come to church and see what he was missing. The two became regulars every Sunday, and it wasn't long before the preacher seemed to hit it off with Vernon. They became good friends and confidants. Vernon answered the Lord's call and became involved by volunteering to be a deacon. He enjoyed helping the preacher draw in new families to the flock. It gave him even more stature. He finally felt as if he were somebody in this world and making his mark, building his legacy. Maybe a child or two would be next. This is what life God chose to give us, a good living with fortune to boot. These were the feelings inside Vernon's thoughts, just rewards for living life in service to those less fortunate. Little did Vernon realize what life truly held for his future. As Vernon spent more and more hours away with preacher Tommy Gibson, his mentor, his time between work and church and left less and less for Vernon and May. What had started out a raging fire in their bedroom soon began its twist into a single smoldering coal about to choke to a staggering ember left in the cold night air. Their physical world together fizzled and burned out. What made it worse was the fact Vernon never saw it coming. Even though he had witnessed the spark she had shared with Billy back before he left those years back, he now took May for granted so badly that he never imagined what could take a calm summer's day and blindly usher it into a pop-up storm turned ravenous tornado. It was hot at the cabinet shop on the day Vernon's life began to change. Work was slowing down. People were having to spend their money in other ways than buying cabinets. Home sales suddenly plummeted, the heat draining not only their will to spend money, but their abilities to make as much. Prices soared while future inflation caused shadows of layoffs to hang overhead. The economy became tight about the time Gerald Ford took over for Nixon. Cash money became very tight in New York City, the financial heart of the country. It passed down quickly to people living in the country. Trust in the government became shattered with Nixon resigning under scrutiny and threat of impeachment. Southern Arkansas and the Red River was part of the country slower to feel the immediate struggle. 
but trouble was on the move and headed everywhere. The heat was on in more ways than just temperature. Vernon now faced a layoff of his own. He had just been told by his foreman, John Wilkie, to gather his personal belongings. The goddamned owner and president, Olin Graham, was too chicken shit to tell his employees. This set Vernon's mood off like a bull being stabbed at a bullfight. From the minute the word layoff stumbled and tripped across John Wilkie's lips, Vernon began his transformation into someone he himself didn't recognize. Why the fuck didn't Graham tell us this shit? Vernon demanded. I got a house and land payments to make. Fucking Graham owns land everywhere, cars, retreat home, and he's gonna lay me off and watch me lose everything while he's too big a pussy to tell me to my face? Bullshit! Vernon stormed out with clenched fists, turned a table saw over to the floor as he passed through the doorway to the parking lot. He wanted to go see Graham himself, face to face, let the prick know how this would hurt him and his wife. But somehow, through either fate or will, Vernon headed home. He couldn't wait to ask for Preacher Gibson's advice of how to handle things. And just as soon as he got home and changed out of his sweat-soaked t-shirt and jeans full of sawdust and grit from Graham's cabinet shop, he'd go to the church and consult him. He just hoped May wouldn't see the fear of losing everything that flushed his face and made him feel it was stamped into his eyes. Vernon felt rage. It wasn't the first time, but this was the harshest. Chapter 3 As Vernon pulled into his gravel drive and up the hill, he parked in front of the detached garage. The driver's side door swung open and he climbed out. His temper settled to a simmer as the door closed with a clunk. The side view mirror, which had begun to recently rattle, fell to the gravel when the door banged closed. He stopped and looked at it as the now cracked mirror shined a bright shattered reflection in his face as if to goad him with one more thing gone wrong on this miserable day. The indignation the mirror gave him pushed his anger back up and he reached out and kicked the door of his 1969 gold Ford Galaxy 500 with a black vinyl top, a car he had been proud of the day he and May drove it off the lot. His rage had caused a large dent that would now need tended to. He suddenly remembered his job and source of income was now absent. God damn it! Vernon swiftly kicked the door again, increasing the indentation in depth. When he saw what he had done, he threw his closed fist onto the top with a deep resounding thud. He saw the top was now concave from his loss of control and the blood spilling from his fingers. He turned while his fist remained clutched as he stiffly walked toward the porch. He stopped just short of stepping up onto the first step. It was quiet. An odd hush seemed to fall over the entire yard. Not a single bird chirped, nor even the slightest of a breeze blow through the leaf-filled branches of the now large hickory tree in the yard. The hickory remained silent, as if Vernon's angered temperament would cause its broad trunk to shudder. And then a sound caught his attention. A distant sound, like maybe an animal groaning softly in pain, but then slightly overridden by the distant squeal of a tire on pavement. Vernon stopped and slowly turned 180 degrees, attempting to decipher where the sound was coming from. Vernon gazed out to the highway to see if a dog had been hit by a car. There had been several dumped dogs out his way, dumped by the damned townsfolk lately. The sound now grew to become small shrieks, followed by groans. He turned toward the screen door, sensing the sound was reverberating from inside. Muffled, but clearly not a sound emanating from the outside as he had surmised a mere ten seconds earlier. Vernon slowly took the steps to the porch and reached for the screen door handle, dreading to pull it open, now suddenly leery of what he may stumble into inside quick reflection of the times he had seen May and Preacher Gibson share glimpses back and forth. He had seen what he imagined could be a look of lust between them. He loved Preacher Gibson so much that he avoided believing Gibson would betray him, especially in that unchristian way. Vernon knew when he and May were first married, he had been able to satisfy May's hunger for the flesh that he saw in her eyes, but now after all these years, he now doubted himself. He had been busy with work, and May had remained busy churching with Preacher Gibson. 
Could it be possible the two could have been sneaking out together on the sly behind his and the preacher's wife? His stomach suddenly felt nauseous. Now, the thought of losing not only a wife and companion, but also his friend and mentor on this horrible day, added to the mix brewing in Vernon's mind. Looky Lou now, what to do, what to do, entered his thoughts. Vernon slowly made his way to the closed French doors, the entrance to his and May's bedroom. He looked across the floor, now remembering the trail of clothes they had peeled from their bodies on their way to pleasure each other in the bedroom, to consummate their marriage and vows to each other those fifteen years back. Forty-five years old now, his wife, almost ten years the younger, had her hunger stayed potent while his suffered in virility? The room even looked different today. Not only the fact that there were clothes scattered around again that weren't his, but as he looked at his home, his mind wrestled with decisions needed to be made. The walls, now yellowed with age and smoke from the fireplace, used to warm the room in the harshness of winter. Instead of the brand new white painted rooms when they crossed that same threshold all those years back, the furniture showing age much like the wrinkles which turned his taut skin loose. The once empty room now cluttered with trinkets neither one needed nor took notice of anymore. He caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror which hung above the fireplace mantel. He wasn't as young and handsome anymore. His clothes filthy from a job he no longer held. Big reddish blue veins bulging from his temples from the pent up anger this day had brought so far. Nasty sweat dripping from his pores and leaving trails in the sawdust still housed on his skin. Yes, life was different, and he hadn't even noticed the changes until this very second. Transformations that had crept past his perception because he was no longer focused on them. His desire for his precious May had somehow seemed to wane. He felt as if a ghost who owed him harm was hovering around him scolding and pointing its all-knowing semi-transparent fingers at all the regularities time had brought change to. He felt something dark ahead of him. Very dark. His urge to turn away and leave met a call too strong to walk away from. Vernon slowly opened the door that would expose the source of the sounds of debauchery he had heard and proved to be what he had expected. The preacher's faith was not strong enough to resist the urge to fornicate with what Vernon swore was an angel. An age-old sin that could twist its way into any profession, even one of a man of cloth preaching salvation for all. What course of action should be taken? What reparation or penance should be collected? Today had already brought so much pain and fear of his future. His losses began to drum up a number inside his brain. His job, soon his home, the car, and now his wife. If he did what the ghost inside his mind told him to do, he would also need to chalk up his freedom. He'd surely go to jail even if it was a crime of passion. Time stood still as he quietly remained pondering before the crack in the door opened enough for all to be seen. Vernon quickly glanced around the room trying to ignore the screams and moans of pleasure on the other side of that damn door between them as the opening became wider the two cheaters still ignorant to his presence and the fact that he had been caught. Vernon instantly spied the hunting rifle on the rack above the television. It was always loaded and ready for protection against intrusion, and there was an intruder in his home, even if his wife didn't see it the way or share the same feelings about Gibson, his friend and preacher who was causing his mate to cry out in ecstasy. He turned once again back to the screen door he had quietly entered. The picture window displayed the sprawling pignut hickory tree with its branches, filling the view of the clear but dusty pane. Old hickory appeared to be reaching out, trying to wave him from doing anything foolish, something that could never be taken back after being done. A trigger can't be unpulled past that click of death. Back and forth his head moved, from the tree limbs beckoning forgiveness to the rifle taunting his manhood and pride and then back to the widening doorway where his mentor lay bawling his wife in an invasion of his trust. Chapter 4 Temptation can invade a man no matter what faith he clings to, enticement to steal a man's wife or an inducement to kill him for it. 
Seldom is there ever a man who sees his life being quickly flushed down the shitter that chose the high road and walks away from being wronged without attempting to right it. I suppose deep down to the marrow of the bone, the nitty of the gritty, Vernon never truly had a choice to make. It was all just a form of stalling and weighing out the reasons when he should have been planning his strategies of how and when to strike. When that door finally glided open enough to visualize the two fuckers who were wrapped together in their sweaty bodies all tangled up and bumping their ugly parts together, eyes wide open with nowhere else to go except wider than a hoot owl stare, well, that's when the look of shock broke their pleasured smiles into one of fear and terror. Truth is, Vernon's eyes looked twice as shocked as theirs when he saw the man banging his wife wasn't his preacher after all. It was that fucking wandering gypsy Billy Hill. After all these years of being disappeared into obscurity, he had rode back to town to deflower Vernon's wife and spoil her goodies. It somehow certainly made Vernon's lack of guilt much easier to accept. After he drew a dead beat on Billy's forehead, he pulled the trigger, leaving a nice round hole in his sweaty head. Vernon felt comfort because he knew nobody round here would ever miss Billy a minute. Now May, on the other hand, he'd need to hold off on making her pay on the immediate. He was going to lay plans out on how that part of the restitution would play. She'd been staying down in the cellar with the other rats and varmints until he decided his course of action. He tied her up real good with wire and rope and duct tape across her pretty pitiful face. He'd applied that on the quick after she, of course, went to blaming Billy and trying to say he forced himself on her. Vernon wasn't always the brightest bulb in the room, but he also wasn't dimmest. Nah, me. You know they say it takes all kinds of people believe stupidity like believing that line of crap. Well, it don't take all kind of people to do the crazy shit that you got caught doing. But the thing is, there are all kinds of people who will do just that, and you showed yourself as one of the willing kind to fuck another man. Another man other than the one you married and promised to love and cherish. I'm a willing soul, too. Just not one of the kinds to forgive your cheating ways. I know you'd say that's what the good Lord asks of me, but from what I've read in the Bible with Preacher Gibson... Vernon tightened the rope around her leg and looped it to the old discarded iron bed before he continued with a wicked smile. Jesus never took himself a wife during his short days spreading the word, so I, I reckon he can't speak of the experience of how one should react when their wife gets caught red pussy cheating on him and then have him balls enough to be asking to do something like forgive her. Cause he ain't never crossed that bridge I'm walking alone, and it's a long way down to forgiveness from where I'm looking. May tried to mumble to Vernon. Problem was, he'd already done something he couldn't undo, so now he was in a fix-it mode to make the problem disappear. There just weren't time to be haggling over sins already committed. He smiled at May as he turned to go back upstairs. Oh, I'll be back, May. That you can count on. As the last step creaked its final sound, the cellar door slapped closed and along with the sound, almost every bit of light in the basement left along with it. There was nothing but the creepy, crawly sounds of pitter-pats across the concrete floor, varmints scampering around the boxes and bed, reclaiming their digs. Vernon put one body to rest that night, his arms sore from cutting Billy into pieces and putting them in buckets to take down to the Red River. He fed the catfish under the moon in quiet of the night. Nothing but the stars scattered overhead to watch him finish the chore. Vernon supposed May deserved to be interned differently. He'd chop her up and bury her parts around old Hickory, the ever-growing tree that had seen so much of their lives, good and not so. Vernon did make a final decision on how to kill his wife, May. He settled on not making too much fanfare over it. He got up early the next morning and brewed himself a pot of coffee and made some toast and mint jelly, May's favorite. He sat on the porch swing, enjoying his breakfast and talking to the hickory branches that stretched toward the porch swing where he sat. May wasn't able to stick around and give me that child, the child I longed to see swinging from one of these limbs with a tire attached by a long rope. 
breaks my heart how she just up and disappeared after I told her I got laid off. Said she couldn't bring a child into a marriage with money troubles. Said it wouldn't be Christian like to bring a new life into poverty and struggle. Breaks my heart to have seen in her such sad spirits. Hard enough for me, but to watch the woman I promised to take care of all our lives, I'm afraid she's capable of self-inflicted harm. Vernon practiced his speech as if readying himself for a part in a school play until he had his lines down pat. When he was satisfied and had eaten the last crumb of toast and swallowed his last drink of coffee, he got up and walked inside dropping his dishes off by the sink. His hand opened the door to the cellar and he walked down into the darkness and picked up the sledgehammer as he walked by. The sound mimicking a melon being cracked open was the only noise made. The light so dim he wasn't even able to see the look of question or fear she may have worn. She didn't even mumble a plea of mercy, not seeing it coming. Vernon spent the day tidying up, taking care of the day's business, and then made a chicken salad sandwich along with a lemonade spiked with old granddad, his favorite. He took his lunch onto the porch swing and began rocking back and forth as he looked out over the freshly dug up spots around the pig nut hickory. He planted the pots of pretty colored flowers he had picked out several days earlier from the hardware store in town. He had hid them in the shed behind the garage. It was almost his and May's anniversary, and he wanted to give her something real pretty that they could put out in the yard and enjoy together, holding hands as they rocked on the swing. Just like old times. He reckoned he now enjoyed the flowers a little more than she, as he picked up his whiskey sour and sip. The ice cubes tumbled to his lips as he swallowed the sweet spiked lemonade. Chapter 5 The next day, when Vernon took his cup of coffee out to his swing, he dropped the cup to the wood slab floor with a thud. He couldn't believe what he saw. There in front of him was the likeness of May in the bark of one of Old Hickory's protruding limbs. There was a huge knot hole in the middle of May's head. Tree sap was running down over her face, he quickly looked around to make sure no one was there to see it. Vernon moved faster than he ever had before, headed to his tool shed to fetch his chainsaw. An hour and twenty minutes later, his woodpile for winter heat had grown considerably from the logs he had finished stacking. He sat down and began trying to come up with a plan to keep making his land payments and eat. Vernon had forgotten that he and May had each filled out life insurance policies. In case one would unexpectedly pass, life could continue once the grief subsided. Neither wanted the other to suffer losing their home or the ability to live, should tragedy strike the family. He smiled, suddenly feeling like at least that problem had been solved. In a couple of hours, he'd go see Preacher Gibson and begin playing the theatrical part of the concerned husband he had practiced. Oh my God, Tommy, where could she have gone? I'm worried what she may do. He smiled an evil grin. The day went as planned, and Preacher Gibson and his wife were too upset and worried about May's disappearance. Vernon would have been a star had he been on Broadway. Vernon's day started out much like it did a lot of other mornings now that he was alone. There was an unexpected problem to his plan, it seemed. It frustrated the hell out of him, and he was getting weary and exhausted of having to amputate his wife's vestige regularly from the reaching limbs of old Hickory. Every so often, there was a new growth in the tree's bark, the same image of his wife's head and torso, her head always with a knot hole, which oozed tree sap from the opening. The cheating bitch was haunting him and keeping him from collecting his due money. How would he make his payments without it? He knew he couldn't leave the property for long anymore. Someone would see the goddamn tree and then he'd die in prison. Vernon's tree was beginning to appear sickly and quite frankly it was now butchered to a point it couldn't possibly survive if he had to keep removing branches every time May's likeness would appear. Preacher Gibson set up a fund in town to raise money to help poor Vernon. He was falling behind on his payments and groceries were becoming sparser as he began to wither away himself. Sure he had fooled the sheriff and everyone in town to believe that May must have either run off with someone else since he had lost his job or possibly taken her own life. That part had worked to plan, but May was still winning and he didn't understand why God was letting this happen. I'm the one who worked 10 and 12 hour days and then go churching with Preacher Gibson till wee hours 
bringing sheep into the fold. All May did was try to entice Preacher Gibson and then pleasure a passing hobo until I caught him in the act. Vernon screamed aloud from his porch to the now oddly trimmed hickory tree. People in town were beginning to talk about how old man Vernon was going crazy. People drove by and saw him standing on his porch pointing to the devastated hickory and sounding as if he were scolding and accusing it like it were human. Time passed and one day out of nowhere, Vernon opened his mailbox with dread, knowing there was going to be another bill he would struggle paying. An answer to his problems came as assuredly as a miracle would. He opened an envelope from the New York Life and Casualty Company and inside the envelope held a check for $350,000, the sum total of the benefit he had purchased while a like amount was carried on him. For May, had things happened differently. The enclosed letter explained how the benefit had been overlooked when May disappeared, but now it had been eight years, one year past the allotted waiting period to collect. He looked up at the tall, irregular trunk of old hickory, barely a limb protruding from its main body. Almost every branch had been surgically removed by his chainsaw because of May's reappearance showing up in the bark. He had trimmed a piece off here and there almost every week for the past eight years, causing neighbors and passers-by to question the sanity of the old geezer that lived in the dilapidated farmhouse across from the Red River off Highway 91. Crazy Vernon, who yelled at a disappearing tree piece by piece. Vernon now felt vindicated. He had won in an odd kind of way. He had lost so much of his life and a woman he risked everything to obtain, but he had now found victory in the form of a rectangular piece of paper, a check, more money than he had worked his entire life for, but now so old and tired. Vernon stopped for a moment and looked around. Had he really won? His car had become a junker that barely ran. His home was falling apart around him. From the shingles badly needing replaced to the clapboard siding rotting underneath what little paint still covered it. Preacher Gibson had long since moved away, taking Vernon's short-lived faith with him. He was lonelier than he had ever been, and he had practically killed old Hickory one limb at a time. It was time to put him to rest too. Vernon walked inside and picked up his phone. He dialed the number of an old friend he had once worked with at the cabinet shop many years ago. They of course hadn't talked regularly or kept up much with each other, but he knew he needed him today. Hello, Carl? Carl Kettner's truck pulled up the drive with a trailer behind it that carried a large stump grinder along with ladders and chainsaws. The next day, Vernon walked out on his porch and surveyed his yard. It was no longer shaded in any form by old hickory. The large sentinel was gone. Nothing but a pile of dirt that covered the base of the tree that had once watched Vernon's life start out with a healthy seed of love between two young lovers. The tree that saw newlyweds run from the car, the husband nabbing up his bride to carry her over the threshold of their new shared nest. The small sapling of that tree, which had almost tripped Vernon on his way in to lose his virginity to the hottest redhead the county ever knew. The same tree that grew quickly during some years when happiness spread out to its roots and yet other years suffered stolen growth from weather and bitterness. Old Hickory witnessed it all. The worst being the event that changed everything. Vernon frantically running around digging holes for body parts here and there, covering them with the pretty anniversary flowers of every variety that he had secretly purchased and planned to hide until the special day. A day maybe May believed he had long forgotten forever. No one would ever know now. Old Hickory would never be able to tell him. Sadness overtook the anger and hurt in Vernon this morning. He slowly walked with his morning coffee out to the mound of dirt where Old Hickory once stood proud and firm. Vernon knelt to the mound and spoke softly. I'm a broken man now, May. I promise you, I did love you. I don't know what happened in our life to bring us to this point. Hell, I don't know why I'm still here talking to a damn tree now that it no longer lives. I just don't feel very good today, and I don't want something to happen without letting you know that I forgive you and hope to God you forgive me. He began to brush the dirt to one side until he felt the strong grain of the wooden base that old hickory once was attached and stood firm. The stump felt odd, and Vernon began to brush away the dirt and sawdust more vigorously until he saw something he couldn't understand. 
He didn't believe the sight he was looking at. Vernon strained to remove his t-shirt and began brushing the soil from the center of the grinded down stump to the outer edges until he could clearly see the gift old Hickory had given him. There, as large as life, ingrained within the wood, was an image of his beautiful maize face. A small hole near the edge of each eye dripped tiny streams of tree sap from each, forming living tears from May herself. I love you, May. I haven't cashed a check from the insurance company, and I never will. It was never money I wanted from you. Never. It was always you. You were my angel. Vernon felt a sudden sharp pain in his chest, and he reached his hand to hold pressure to his heart. He looked back down at May's image etched into old hickory. After a sudden last gasp, he fell to the ground and his head rolled beside May's as a tear ran into his smiling lips. He looked at peace finally. A likeness of Vernon's face began to appear from within the grain of old hickory as two tiny saplings popped from under the grass with a tiny leaf each. They were twisted together in a love knot and sprouted in unison to catch the sun's rays. A light breeze blew from the direction of the house, rolling a tiny sheet of paper from the porch and onto the grass, then rolled across the lawn until it caught on Vernon's finger. It was the check made payable to Vernon Hasker for the sum of $350,000. It clung to his wrinkled fingers until a stiff wind picked it up again and hurled it end over end toward the banks of the Red River, never to be claimed or seen again. I sure hope you enjoyed tonight's tale, The Old Dead Tree, written by Eli Pope. Eli Pope is a major writing contributor for Fear from the Heartland. Eli began his love of creating stories back in high school creative writing classes. The passion lay dormant for decades, while life took him different directions. The stories never left, and he finally succumbed to the voices in his head, telling him to put them on paper. And put them on paper he did, earning the Literary Titan Award for The Judgment Game and The Spark of Wrath, books one and two of the Mason Jar series, which you, dear listener, can hear on audible.com, performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. The only thing I will tell you, Billy J. Cater is a bad dude. You can hook up with Eli Pope at his website, elipope.com. That's Eli, E-L-I, Pope, P-O-P-E, dot com. He can also be located on Facebook at author Eli Pope, or search groups on Facebook, The Mason Jar Room. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at 
Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.